Not too long ago, I beat the hardest challenge in another crab's treasure. After doing the challenge, I decided to take a break and just play games on my backlog. It's been fun, clearing games I've had for so long. But in the back of my mind this entire time, I had another thought. I want to play another crab's treasure again, but what else could I possibly do? So I racked my brain for a bit, and there was one idea I had that no one else had done yet either. I've got an idea! One idea that I didn't think was going to be possible. You see, when you start another crab's treasure, after your show get stolen and you get chased by the polluted crabs, you reach the fork, which is the only weapon in the game. It's your main form of combat and Krill's best friend, turning him from a defenseless little crab to the hero of the new Carcinians. So what would happen if you didn't pick it up? That's what I wanted to find out. Instead of grabbing the fork, I went around it and the game didn't stop me. From here, I knew what I had to do to be able to answer the question, can you beat another crab's treasure with no fork? Now immediately, I found a major issue for the run. Running to the moonshell in the shallows, I decided to enter it. The problem with that, at any point in the game, if I enter a moonshell, Krill says, oh hey look, there's a fork in here. And Krill pops out with a fork in his hand. Meaning that I could never shell a port to another moonshell and I could never level up, making this another level zero run. Since I got the fork in my hand, I had to quit and restart the run. Making my way back through the beginning of the game, I decided to grab the first pickup, a bread claw. Picking up the trash around the map would make it a lot easier for me to get microplastics, which I needed for my master plan. For this run, my plan was to increase my stowaway capacity to 9, which was the max amount of capacity I could have. The idea I had was to get these three stowaways, Anemone Plus, Phytoplankton, and Zooplankton. Anemone Plus would increase my MSG stat, which I needed to increase in order to do more damage with my shell spells. The more important thing though was that it would make it possible for me to equip the other two stowaways. These two were the key to the run. The phytoplankton makes it so I recover an umami charge every time I heal, and the zooplankton recovers a little bit of umami whenever I take damage. I thought the plan was perfect. Two stowaways that go hand in hand with each other, taking damage and healing meant I would be able to recover my umami, allowing me to deal with whatever challenges came my way. Continuing forward, I skip past the fork, officially beginning the no fork challenge. In this run, I was planning on picking up as many upgrade items as possible. So after picking up another bread claw, I grabbed the first blood star limb in the game. As you can see, collecting 5 blood star limbs permanently increases my health. And this would be the only real way for me to upgrade my health, which I was gonna need for my plan further in the run. Heading to the castle, I do the same strategy I did to get inside in the last challenge. Since I knew at this point, I wouldn't be able to beat any bosses, including Nefro, who is the boss you're supposed to fight to unlock shells around the shallows. Picking up the hook, I headed towards the moon snail's domain. I had to get access to certain skills on the skill tree, but I knew that once I entered the moon snail's domain, I wouldn't be able to leave without shellaporting, so I had an idea on how to escape. Making it to the cave's entrance, I equipped the soda can, finally obtaining one of the few means of hurting enemies in the run, Fizzle. I pushed deeper into the moon snail's domain, making sure to break the crystals for later. An extra benefit of breaking the crystals was that it also refills my umami bar, which is the only way I can attack for the entire run. I I jumped on this jellyfish since there was a very important upgrade I could get early on here. The heart kelp sprout, an item that permanently increases how many heals I could carry, which is why getting as many heart kelp sprouts as I could was going to be key to making this challenge beatable. Picking up another blood star limb, there was nothing else I needed at this point, so I went to the menu and died instantly. Because I can't enter any moon shells, the game just sends me all the way back before the fork, giving me access to shell spells without even reaching the moon snail. Doing this caused a major problem for me that I would soon come to realize. Oh no! But for now, this was the best case scenario for me. Now, with the hook and umami, I decided to wander around the shallows and pick up as many Bloodstar limbs as I could. After going around and collecting what I could at this point, I went back into the castle to see if I could make it to the next area by skipping the Magista boss fight. Making my way up the sand stairs, I decided to jump on the sand wall and see if I could reach the hook point that you normally get to after you meet the moon snail. Just barely making it to the hook, I grabbed the last blood star limb I needed to complete my first batch, increasing my health. From here, my goal was to land on this first sand arch and to jump over the castle walls. After a couple attempts at it, I managed to land on the arch, using each arch as a platform and making it behind the castle, an area you can't normally reach until you do the Magista boss fight. Running on the sand bridge out of slack tide, I made it to the next area, the reef's edge. I decided to pick up the sauce nozzle shell, and this is where I learned the problem that 
I mentioned before. Trying to use my shell spell, nothing happened. Huh? And from here, I learned that for the rest of this run, there was only going to be a few shells that actually worked. At this point, I realized this run was going to be rough. We had to run everywhere since shellaporting didn't work, and I had no idea which shells worked. The only one I knew for sure I could rely on was the soda can. Arriving at New Carcinia, I went around and spoke to people about my shell until I reached Nemma, where I decided to dismiss some stowaways to get some microplastics. I was gonna need a lot of microplastics, since after the first few stowaway upgrades, it was gonna cost a lot. Buying the first capacity upgrade, I ran up and spoke to the owner of Shellfish Desires, where I realized I needed to get insurance for the soda can, so that I would always have access to it when I died. With no microplastics though, I decided to just pick up some more trash around the city. I also decided to get the Urchin Bomb ability, since it would be one of my few attacks in the run. Before I continued forward, I wanted to get some upgrades from the moon snail. Knowing I would be warped back to the sand bridge, I pressed die instantly. Running back towards the castle, I had to look for a way back in. The guards at the bottom had a barrier that made it impossible for me to make it back into the castle, so I had to search for another way in, and to my luck, I found a crack in the castle's walls. The crack allowed me to run underneath and re-enter the queen's chamber through the floor. Successfully making it back, I headed towards the moon snail. I had no idea how I was gonna escape once I reached him, but I was determined to find a way. Making my way through quickly, I climbed up this left rock wall and jumped between the rocks to avoid activating the boss fight, falling near the end and sliding down fast enough to go past the boss before the barrier could form, skipping straight past him. I broke the crystals around the moon snail and decided to take care of the boss so I wouldn't have to deal with him later when I come back to get more upgrades. Slowly but surely, I continued to climb up this little rock and do damage to him with fizzle, running back to the umami recharge every time I would run out. It was just rinse and repeat until the boss was dead. The boss being dealt with, I finally spoke to the moon snail, obtaining my first two abilities, parry and streamline. These two abilities were going to be essential and also unlock paths to other abilities I was planning to get. The way of the hermit path had the most important skills for the run. Housewarming, which gives me a free shell spell use without using my umami charges, and circle of life, which restores an umami charge when I defeat an enemy with my spells, also giving me a boost to my MSG stat, which meant my spells would do even more damage. I was also going to make sure to pick up every single one of the umami training skills in the tree, as those would be permanent upgrades towards my MSG stat. Doing the math, I was gonna need 175 crystals to get all the skills I needed. Oh, after getting my first skills, I died instantly, warping back to the shallows. For some reason, after reaching the moon snail, when you krill yourself, it warps you into the moon snail's domain. I immediately thought I was gonna have to restart the run, but I had to try and see if there was a way out. Running up these rocks here, I managed to get enough momentum to boost upwards and land on the higher rocks, jumping out of the boss room and running back to the entrance of the moon cave. Now here was the true challenge. There was no real way to leave the entrance, but I had to find a way or else this run was over. I tried jumping on these rocks, but Krill just slides off. Jumping on some of the other rocks, I do manage to make it up here from this rock, where I learned something very important. No matter where Krill is, if he's able to get his body still after T-posing, you're able to move around again. From this indent, I jumped over to this crack, and it allowed me to stand on it, but I couldn't seem to figure out what to do from here. After a bunch of attempts, I managed to jump up here with the help of Streamline, which gives me enough of a forward boost to land on it. From this indent, I managed to find another spot I could land on, and it was just trial and error for a while as I tried to land on top of this rock, which didn't work at all. I decided that instead of trying to jump up here, I would try to swim around it and land behind it, and it worked. I made my way into this crack so I wouldn't fall off, jumping to this rock and landing on it, where Krill began sliding forward, falling out of the moon cave's entrance and back into the shallows. The impossible was indeed possible. Since I took care of the boss in the moon cave, the castle has gotten polluted which allows me to pick up the anemone stowaway that I needed. Making my way back through the destroyed castle, I made my way to the sand arches to do the skip I did earlier, but... 
I just fell through. For some reason, after the castle gets wrecked, you aren't able to land on the arches anymore. So I had to find another way to skip the Magista boss fight. I wanted to keep trying the arches to see if there was some area to land on, but it wasn't working. So after a few attempts, I decided to try landing on the edge right next to the arch, and I actually managed to land on it. Running forward, I jumped down onto the upper floor of the castle and run through the now open doors, successfully avoiding Magista. Making my way back to New Carcinia, with my newly acquired microplastics, I bought shell insurance for the soda can, which would make things slightly easier since I wouldn't have to search for a usable shell whenever I died. My next goal was to buy the upgrades Pronathan had in his shop, a heart kelp pod and three blood star limbs, and I knew exactly how I was going to get those microplastics. The next big step was to get all the map pieces. So my first stop was Padras. Killing him would give me the first map piece and 20,000 microplastics. I had learned of a way to kill Padras super quickly, and so I made my way to this point on the cliff edge and led Padras to me. He ended up instant killing me. Making my way back to the same spot, I led him over again, but this time I fell off and tried to make him move closer to the edge by jumping off, so he would walk towards me as I was falling. After a couple falls, I respawned on the cliff edge with the map piece in my hand. Padras was dead. I began my collectathon in the sands between, running around and picking up everything I could at this point. Heading back to the city, I sold some trash and dismissed some stowaways, buying some more capacity upgrades and almost all the items I needed from Pronathan. I began wandering the sands between, looking for crystals since I was gonna need them for the skill tree, eventually running into Frederick, a stowaway I planned to keep as it had potential to come in handy later. Finishing my search for now, I headed into the expired grove. I was planning to enter Floatsome Vale from the expired grove. Since there was an entrance to it at the start of the forest, I could reach with some gimmicky platforming. Entering Floatsome from here was important because it would allow me to skip past the Inkerton fight at the entrance of Floatsome since I knew I wouldn't be able to get past him at this point. After managing to to reach the floatsome entrance, I did some platforming on this rock to get into the swamp without activating the consortium, the boss that you're supposed to fight from entering floatsome from the grove. Arriving at the trash I used in my other run to skip a lot of floatsome, I used it once again, heading to the cave that leads to the ceviche sisters. The only reason I was coming here was to pick up Anemone Plus, the stowaway that I needed for my original plan. After picking it up, I leave the cave. I was Hell not gonna be fighting man, the sisters. The I ran towards this rock wall that leads up to the mailbox and after doing some platforming and cheesing my way around this i managed to make it past and reach the second map piece i also pick up another blood star limb here i ran towards the scuttling sludge steamroller the boss who had the last piece to my master plan i had to kill him because he drops the zooplankton which i absolutely needed to get my plan to work i had no way to kill him yet though and tried my best to run away but he chased me until i was dead which warped me back at the grove entrance to float some, which worked out in my my favorite. I decided to see if I could kill the easiest boss in the game, the diseased lycanthrope, but I couldn't kill him with my stats at this point. Leaving and heading back to the city, I sold enough trash to get the last thing I needed from Pronathan. Going straight back to the grove, I destroyed some more crystals and headed over to another blood star lip, where I had gotten into a side path that I felt I could use to skip past the diseased lycanthrope. Jumping over towards this edge, I fall off twice before landing behind the lycanthrope, making it to the cave below and pushing forward, getting closer and closer to Hakia. Running straight past all the enemies, I found a soda can and an umami recharger. Once again, I used the bridge to Hakia and easily got over to the other side, making it up to him and beginning the fight. See, I had an idea to try and get him to jump off the boat, but after managing to get out of the barrier a few times and leading him towards the edge of it, the plan didn't seem to be working. That was until a few attempts later, for no reason at all, after another shot at having him jump off the edge, when I spawned back on the boat, I was out of bounds of the fight. Hakia couldn't reach me, but I could reach him. I knew exactly what to do. Using Fizzle to damage him, I would run all the way back to the Umami Recharger and then run back to continue damaging him. I did this over and over again until Hakia was dead and I had obtained the final map piece. From here, I planned on heading through the crab village because part of my plan was to defeat Topoda. Topoda is a boss that I skipped in my last run because he wasn't necessary, but here it would be really important. Beating Topoda would unlock the most valuable upgrades in this run, the Old World Worlds, a collectible that permanently increases your umami meter, which would make it so I could use my shell spells more often. Speeding through the village, picking up the intern outfit on the way, I ran past all the enemies I could, making it to Topoda in no time. Initially 
initiating the fight, I was very quickly overwhelmed. There was no way I was beating him at this point. So instead, I went back to New Carcinia to sell some junk, selling exactly enough to be able to upgrade my stowaway capacity once more. Making my way out of the city, I decided to head back to the Moon Snail's domain. I jumped up the coral, landing on this higher up platform, timing my jump and swim to get just enough spacing to be able to air dodge onto the other side. All I had to do now was land on the bridge. And with a decently spaced jump and swim, I make my way back onto the bridge, returning into the castle grounds once more. Now, I couldn't use the same way to enter the castle I used earlier. If I entered the queen's chamber, I was worried the boss fight would start. So instead, I began a search for a new way into the shallows. Jumping on the sand wall, I platformed along the barrier until I reached the end where it so happens to have a crack in the barrier, allowing me to enter. But with nowhere to go up here, I decided to jump down. I ended up under the castle. Jumping around in this underground chamber, I managed to get out from the ground and open the front gate shortcut. I now had a way in and out of slack tide, but to avoid having to come back ever again, I decided to get all the crystals in this area before going to the moon snail. That way, I could buy all the skills I needed in one go. I had 126 crystals, and like I said earlier, I needed 175. So I had to hope I could find 50 more crystals in the shallows, or else I would have to come back here all over again later on, and I did not want to do that. Going on a journey around the shallows, I began collecting crystals. Crystal after crystal, enemy after enemy. I realized that I still didn't have an efficient way to recover my umami. Deciding that I would finally swap in Frederick, cause you see, my little buddy here, he could attack. This is where I realized that I was gonna have to rely on Frederick a lot. While I was able to restore some of my umami in attack, I was still struggling to maintain it, and Frederick would be able to take Anything care of my office. So. Continuing my crystal search, Frederick claimed the lives of many, supplying me with the crystals from these amped up enemies. After reaching 155 crystals, I knew I didn't have many crystals left in the shallows, but there were still a couple things I could do to get closer to my goal of 175. It was time to fight some bosses, since bosses give you quite a few crystals once you beat them. Making my way to the royal shell splitter, I had no shell as it was broken earlier, meaning it was Frederick's time to shine. Running around, I led the boss to a spot where he would be stuck behind this can while Frederick did decent bits of damage to him. Standing at a distance, Frederick gets him down to half before the shell splitter does anything. I lead him behind this sandbox. He ends up just clipping through with one of his attacks, so I make my way around him and back inside, putting him against a corner that he couldn't clip his way through. Being easy pickings for my best friend Frederick, he finishes him off, giving me 5 more crystals. Just 15 more crystals, and I needed access to shells anyways, so I headed to the vending machine, equipping a soda can and starting the fight with Nefro. Hitting Nefro with two urchin bombs, I tagged Frederick in to take care of the rest of the fight. As I parried Nefro over and over again, he could not get in on me. Knocking him over a few times, I was only getting hit by his unblockable attack. In no time, he was dead. 10 crystals left now, and with access to shells around the map, it was time to do the final cleanup before heading to the moon snail. Boom, boom, bop, 174. I needed one more crystal, and what could have been better than ripping it out of my least favorite enemy's guts? 175. It was time to talk to the moon snail for the final time. Since the hook that leads up these stairs is broken, I jumped on this statue and swam over to the stairs, running up and realizing I wouldn't be able to hook across like normal. I jumped up on this crack on the sand wall since it puts me just high enough to make it to the pipe, making my way back through the moon caves and reaching the moon snail. Unlocking every skill I needed in one go, I finally felt like I was making good progress. Finishing my last conversation with the moon snail, it was finally time to leave the shallows for good. But for some reason, I couldn't didn't seem to get the same momentum I got the first time I left the moon cave, so I had to find another way out. I ran up these rocks, finding crevices to land on and getting up here. Swimming over to this crack, I looped around using the momentum to jump and swim onto this anemone. Using it as a platform, I jumped toward the rock wall and barely managed to land on it, jumping all the way up and finally escaping the boss room. That was my final challenge in the shallows. Using my exit from earlier, I had escaped, once again skipping Magista and saying goodbye to Slagtide for the rest of the run. Getting back to New Carson I purchased another capacity upgrade, leaving me one away from being maxed out. Completing the map pieces, it was time to run it back with Tapota. Making my way to the grove, I wanted to kill the diseased Lycanthrope. Using my fizzles, I drained his health super quickly, finishing the fight in no time flat. Beating him gave me the Chum stowaway, my second little buddy who would be Frederick's partner in crime because Chum, Chum could attack too. Racing through the crab village, I was once again face to face with Tapota. I had to learn his parry timing because it would be the only way for me to buy 
enough time for Frederick and Chump to take care of him. Attempt after attempt, I made use of each loss to gain practice against his different swings. Slowly but surely, getting used to the timings of all his attacks from the first half of the fight. I even learned that I could use the Crab Hus decoy ability, although I wasn't going to be using it much at all. It took me a lot of attempts before I finally realized in the middle of fighting him that I should probably equip Chum as well. Finally bringing together the dynamic duo of Frederick and Chum. Getting Tapota down to half, he begins using his ultimate technique and kills me pretty much instantly. But now I was confident. I knew how to parry his moves and Frederick and Chum were slowly but surely draining Tapota. The only problem I was having was dodging his ultimate technique. As the deaths piled on, I began knocking Tapota down over and over again. And a couple minutes later, I had taken him down. Obtaining the Mantis Punch, I could finally get rid of these cubes around the map, most of which hiding the old world worlds I needed. Picking up the first one here, it was time to search for more. Making my way out of the expired grove, I stopped for a second to see my progress. I was getting so close to having everything I needed to finally complete my original plan. An old world here, blood star limb there, another one and another. I went around picking up everything I could. I finally headed to the Floatsome Veil vale entrance to take care of the mini boss fight with Inkerton so I could get inside Floatsome without having to loop around the grove. Grabbing the whirls around Floatsome, it was time to kill the scuttling sludge steamroller. Using my fizzles on him, I brought out my fish buddies, jumped on this trash, and sat still while they took care of the rest. And after a couple minutes, I finally had the final piece to my original plan. I decided to leave Floatsome and finally head over and pick up the Bobbit Trap, the savior of the last challenge that I was gonna make use of later on. Re-entering Floatsome, it was factory time. Making it inside, I activated the first magnet and pushing further, I ended up falling to my death and having to run all the way back. Since dying puts me all the way back at the entrance of Floatsome. After making my way back to the magnet, for some reason it wasn't working at all. Even though it was still activated, it wasn't moving, so I had to find another way into the factory. Using this trash heap here, I began using the speed boost from rolling in the shell to launch myself over to this little island, managing to make it further into the factory. From here, I went through the factory normally for a bit, and that's when I I realized I didn't want to go through this too much longer. Instead, I jumped on top of this magnet, whose track passes by the entrance to the next boss. I jumped off, swimming over and using an air dodge to barely land on the edge of the entrance. Skipping the rest of the factory, I jumped down the hole and began the fight with Volte. This fight was going to be interesting because Frederick and Chum couldn't hit Volte. <laughs> So I had no way to conserve my umami. But thanks to my umami upgrades, I could use my abilities more and they were doing a lot more damage. I had to figure out how to get my umami back. And the best strategy I came up with was purposely getting hit by the toast to recharge my umami. At this point, my recording started going crazy. My OBS was breaking and so was my game. The recording kept skipping parts of the fight and my screen was tearing. So I ended up closing the game. Because of my OBS breaking, I couldn't get all the footage of the fight. But I did get this part near the end where I'm using using the toast to farm my umami back and this part where I'm farming some umami with the vibrator as well. In the end, I was able to clutch it and take her down with the mantis punch. Leaving the boss room, I was at a point of no return. The next thing I had to do was fight Roland, but once I got on the boat, there would be no way for me to get back since I couldn't shell a port. So before I continued, I went to the sands between to pick up the last few things I could get, grabbing a heart kill sprout and an old world, selling junk and dismissing stowaways to get the last capacity upgrade. Making Making my way back to Floatsome, I got on the boat and pressed forward. There was no way back now, so all I could do was push forward. Jumping through this area quickly, I made it to Roland. My plan was to deal with him the same way I did in the past, using the Bobbit Trap to push him out of bounds into a spot I could easily hit him. But with no fork, this strategy wasn't gonna work. I even managed to push him out in the same spot I pushed him in the other challenge. But Fred and Chum couldn't reach him since the bumpers would just push them back. Attempt after attempt of pushing him out of bounds, as I was going to give up on my strategy, this happened. <laughs> Roland just got stuck up here for no reason. And from there, all I had to do was sit still while Fred and Chump took him down. I was shocked. I didn't even do anything, but it seemed like the game wanted to give me a hand. Either way, it was time to get through the Unfathom now. Walking through with my fishy pals, Krill gets knocked out. Waking up, I make my way through the Unfathom. With nothing of interest happening, I arrived at the gate. I used it before to skip the entirety of the Unfathom, and I was gonna use it again. But this time with no fork, I couldn't seem to get enough height to hop 
hop over the door. But I did seem to find a little platform on the door itself that put me just under the top of the door. I felt that I could make this jump, so I spent a while just jumping and rolling to try to get over. Like, a long while. But eventually, I made it over. Skipping the entirety of the Unfathom once again, I quickly made it to Inkerton. I was gonna use the same strategy I used in the other challenge to beat him, using the Bobby Trap to push him out of bounds and pushing him off. Getting it to work again, he landed on a platform below. Weirdly enough though, I got pushed through the barrier too and just continued forward on the bridge, causing him to fall and taking care of Inkerton at record speeds. It was time for the old ocean. Using the elevator down and arriving at the bottom, Krill didn't want to get off and he was just stuck here for a good while. But after he hops off, I make my way through the old ocean. I couldn't do the old ocean skip this time around since I couldn't enter the moon shells, which meant I had to go through this area the old fashioned way. Avoiding as many enemies as I could and picking up a few more upgrades I could find in the area, I arrived at the next boss. And I was gonna skip him too. I could feel the end was near and I wanted to see if I could reach the credits. Once again, using the strategy I found in the last challenge, I clipped behind the king, jumping on the toilet paper and diving into the toilet. Only two bosses left, Preya and Firth. Making my way down to Preya, I was ready to take her down. This time around, I was gonna fight her straight up since my Pog strategy from last time would take a while and I knew I could do a lot of damage with my spells. Making it to the second phase a lot quicker than I thought, I wanted to try something I saw from a comment in my last video because I didn't believe it. And to my surprise, what they said actually worked. So thank you for that. Sadly, I still got hit by a laser somehow, so I had to try again. A great thing about this fight is that killing the crowds Preya spawns in actually reached charges my umami even if she's the one killing them with her explosions since they drop a full charge of umami this made the fight so much easier allowing me to use my abilities throughout the whole fight and oh my goodness did i use them mantis punch was one of my best friends it did so much damage in one strike so i made sure to abuse it this fight took quite a few attempts but after a bit i made it to phase two again using the strat from the comment it actually worked out this time finishing the fight it was time for the final challenge first I was moving through the end game super quickly, but just like the last challenge, once I started fighting Firth, I was stuck for a bit. Using my Bobbit trap setup, I placed a trap in front of him to get a free hit with the Mantis Punch, doing a ton of damage. Getting Firth stuck behind the two shells and having my fishies out, I was able to slowly chip at him. I got him to his second phase in a few attempts, learning that my fish pals wouldn't be able to help me since Firth is flying and they couldn't reach him. Having no umami, he killed me, but with this new knowledge, I continued working at him, thinking of a plan to to be able to take care of him for good. Many attempts later, as I got better at parrying and dodging his attacks, I was knocking him down constantly, making use of the Thimble's fortify ability that actually worked, allowing me to recover a mommy with the Zooplankton self. I also learned that the Yokult's ability worked too, giving me a free heal in the middle of the fight, which helped me conserve my heals for the second phase. And eventually, I got him to phase 2 once again. This time with more chances to recover my umami, I took the time to learn his attack timings. This is where I realized I should have been using my crab stowaways to to revive whenever I die, which would bring me back with enough charges of umami to do a mantis punch. I ended up dying again, but I knew I had Firth in my clutches. I began making it to first, second phase more consistently. So what was the problem now? I kept forgetting to equip the revives. So after using one up, I wouldn't equip another one and end up dying. And this happened so many times. I was beginning to think I was going stupid with the amount of times I could have beaten him if I just remembered to equip the revive. So after a few attempts of stupidly forgetting to equip it, I actually remembered this time around, bringing Firth closer and closer to death. That was until here, where I missed a few of my attacks, getting hit. I went to equip another revive, but I had no more, and that's when I was hit in the face with dread. No more revives, no more heals, no soda can, I had no way to recover Umami and do damage to him, so I had to let myself die. Look at his health. I could have killed him with a tap, but I couldn't let that demotivate me. A couple attempts later, I made it back to phase 2, hitting him with Mantis Punch and bringing him closer to death's door, this time making sure I would hit him with the attacks. Using my revives, this time around I had enough umami to finally take Firth down, equipping the perfect whirl and putting Firth in the dirt. Running through, I paused to equip Frederick, coming to the realization that I needed to hit Pronathan in order to end the game. And with no fork and my umami meter gone, I was suddenly worried I couldn't finish the game. I wanted to see if maybe Frederick could hit Pronathan, but nope, nothing. So on a whim, I tried using my umami and... 
it worked. I shot out a Bobbit trap and got rid of Pronathan. Shooting out a few more, I equipped the home shell. The run was completed, with this being the only time I used my mic during recording. I did it again! Blade again! No fork! I freaking Zombies did it! Spend their whole oh lives my saving god, others from this challenge was insane. I love this game. Aggro crab is so goaded. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you all so much for 13k views on the last challenge. I was not expecting that and I'm so grateful, seriously. And aggro crab, I'm still waiting on my crow plushie. So if you see this, please send me one. All jokes aside, I appreciate you all. Peace.